Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our smart irrigation controller workshop. Uh, just a few little tidbits of information before we get started. You should see on the right of your screen a little Q&A section. Uh, please post your questions as they come up and we can address them throughout the presentation or at the end. But just so that we have time to, to make sure that we do address your question, if you're thinking of anything as you're going through uh, the, the presentation, please post that. We will also have information on how to contact us after because sometimes it does take a little while for question formulation and we understand that. So without further ado, we are going to get started. Okay, welcome to this uh, presentation on smart irrigation controllers. Um, we're excited that you can join us. Um, smart irrigation is a um, up and coming technology that is pretty much taking irrigation by storm right now. And um, knowing whether it's right for you is probably a pretty important detail. Um, if everything is working good, we're going to go ahead and get started. So smart controllers, oh, I'm sliding, I'm sliding, it's sliding fast. There we go, there we go. So yeah, this is smart controller pre uh, presentation and um, what makes them so smart? Well, irrigation is simply replacing the amount of lost water to keep your plants happy. Um, when, you're, when your plants are, uh, when the soil moisture is at the right level, your plants are happy. Um, it doesn't matter if it's 110 degrees outside, as long as they've got the proper amount of moisture to give away to cool themselves, chances are they're going to be uh, you know, happy and healthy. Um, if your plant material doesn't have enough water, that's when it starts to uh, dry up and desiccate. It can't cool the surfaces of, its, of the leaves of the plant or the foliage of the plant um, if it's not a leafy plant. Um, and temperature starts to go up on the surfaces of the plant, and that's how uh, the sun actually damages plants. So um, smart controllers have the ability to estimate the depleted amount of moisture that's happening both from the plant and from the soil. They also adjust the system to replenish that water. So um, different controllers have different capabilities as far as adding water to the existing schedule or adjusting the schedule to happen more often. So there's a lot of different um, capabilities in different smart controllers. They can also adjust the schedule without any human intervention. One of the one of the deals with an irrigation controller um, today, if you're taking care of it or if you have a landscaper who's taking care of your irrigation controller, um, it needs some regular adjustment. And um, regular adjustment, you know, if your landscaper's there once a week, um, I doubt quite seriously whether he would change it once a week. Um, it would need changed on a regular basis at least once a month, maybe a little bit less than that. Sometimes the long hot periods, it can, it can stay the same through a long hot period. Um, but the beauty of these uh, smart controllers are they can adjust the watering schedule on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, some of them even hourly, to uh, increase or decrease as the needs change. So it's one of the nice things about them. <clears throat> what they won't do, if you got a really bad irrigation system, throwing a smart controller on it's probably not going to fix a bad design, a bad irrigation system. Um, they can't. Uh, they're they're not going to. Um, they're not going to make you more efficient if your irrigation system is not up, been kept up in the proper way. Um, they're not going to help you find any leaks. Um, there are other devices that can do that, and they definitely aren't going to mow the lawn. Um, there's a lot of uh, details that you need to know to determine whether you're going to be the right person for a smart controller. Um, not everybody is. Um, once we once we put a smart controller on a house, I've seen them get taken back off only because nobody wants to spend the time to operate it. 
even on a regular irrigation controller, some people go, well, I got to learn how to do it every time I go out there because they just don't remember the details about how it functions. Um, I've heard it said that, you know, uh, you put a smart controller on a bad irrigation system and all you're going to do is waste water more efficiently. So we don't want to see that happen. So a lot of the details will involve, uh, you know, you know, uh, doing some maintenance on your irrigation system before you install one. Yeah, you could waste water even with a smart controller. Um, you know, if the controller were being adjusted on a regular basis, what we would develop is like a bell curve with our water use. As it gets warmer, the the need for more irrigation occurs. Um, all the brochures that we de we develop and we distribute for uh, um, plant watering requirements and for water conservation, they all involve watering on a deep and infrequent irrigation cycle. Um, by doing that, you know, we might tell you to water your plant material if it's on drip irrigation for a couple of hours, once every four or five days if it was really hot. And maybe as far apart as once every 14 days if it were, you know, the middle of winter time. But it's the same irrigation episode that usually would happen. And so there's going to be a little bit of waste involved if, if that's the case. The properly program smart controller will adjust the watering schedule automatically. It will add little bits of water and take away a little bits of water and and you know those little tiny bits of water can turn out to be quite a bit when it goes through the whole month's worth of water. Different controllers um, approach that change in different ways. Uh, some of them some of them um, you know different controllers function on different different systems. One of one of the systems might use um, historic information like it knows how hot it is in June and June this year isn't that much different than June next year or the year three years ago. Um, so it knows that that historic information about what the evapotranspiration rate is and we're going to talk about that a little bit here in a minute. Um, so the evaporation from the plants and the transpiration from the, the transpiration from the plants and the evaporation from the soil um, joined together is the amount of water that needs to be replaced. And so if the controller knows that information and it knows that it's a little bit hotter or it knows that it just rained, it can make the adequate adjustment to to modify that water to save you some water. And the goal, the goal with the smart controllers is it's trying to keep a, a optimal amount of soil moisture at all times. If the conditions are always, you know, just perfect for the plant, not too wet, not too dry, not wet too often, um, you know, your plants are going to be healthier. How does it know to adjust? Um, you know, it's it's monitoring evaporation. We have um, um, weather stations throughout the valley that are uh, operated um, by ASMAT that are studying how much current evaporation is going on during the day. Um, every day it adds up and, you know, the newspaper uh, publishes and still does publish, has for a long time, what the three day rate of evaporation is, what the daily rate of evaporation is, what the weekly rate of evaporation is. And it helps people stay on track so that they're changing as the conditions are changing. Um, that's what the irrigation controllers are going to do. They're going to uh, measure that evaporation and transpiration from the soil and, and be able to adjust accordingly. Um, if that moisture doesn't get added at the right time, then those leaf surfaces are going to get hot and plants are going to desiccate a little bit. And we don't want that. We want our plants happy. So that evaporation from the soil and transpiration from the plants is that evapotranspiration that is the monitored number. And um, on a daily basis, um, it's, it's, it's calculated. And on a monthly basis, it's all added up and on an annual base, it's as much as uh, six to seven feet of evaporation in a year. So a swimming pool would literally, if we weren't putting water in it all the time, 
most swimming pools would evaporate completely in one year in our environment. <clears throat> so some of the controllers work on different measures of, of that depletion of water. Some of them are using that historical data. Some of them get broadcast information data. It's kind of like a paid service that you pay a, uh, a company and it sends you the information that you need on a regular basis. Um, this is how the controller started out. Um, they started out and they wanted to make more money than just the cost of the controller. They wanted to have a service that put the information in to help you save water. Um, it didn't go very well, so that's kind of a, a fading kind of a thing. Um, another opportunity is uh, uh, personal weather stations. Um, I know a lot of people in the city of Scottsdale that are really into their techie, their they're um, into their irrigation system. They, they monitor it themselves and they, they went to the trouble to buy a weather station. I know somebody who has a $700 weather station, but if you buy a $700 weather station, just think if something goes bad there, then you've got maintenance and uh, repairs and replacement parts. Um, you know, if you have any of that additional hardware like that, that's, that's, that's an expense. Um, today, you can just, you know, put your, in most cases, you can put in your zip code and you can get weather information about your zip code and the controller will function on that weather information. Another type of, um, of a, there's a sensor that can go down into the soil that will um, modify the irrigation controller's operation through soil moisture sensing. Um, it's been proven to be the most effective way of doing it. Um, they just haven't come up with a real effective sensor that doesn't require maintenance and lasts for a long time and isn't real expensive. And when they do that, um, I'm sure a lot more soil sensors will go in. Um, they do know that the soil is wet, uh, regardless of whatever else happened. And if the soil is wet, then chances are irrigation doesn't need to happen. Um, the way they work is they just basically interrupt the uh, common wire, um, the way the solenoids on a, on a valve runs. It has a current that runs through the, through the solenoid, turns it into an electromagnet, it sucks a plunger up, and the flow of water is allowed to go because the pressure in the valve isn't holding the valve closed any longer. And then uh, you, may, you, you may have a, a soil sensor in a, in a place in your yard, but is it the most effective? You may need to have more than one. You may need to have one that's a little deeper for your trees. You may need to have one that's kind of shallow for your grass. And then uh, all we, we've got shrubs in the middle. So soil sensors, they might be um, uh, cost prohibitive right now, but eventually I think they're going to get it down to a, a better, a better uh, uh, price in a, in a better way and, and it's pretty effective at saving water. Um, I think they did some tests and um, um, monitoring the evapotranspiration and, and monitoring the soil moisture and I think uh, more water was saved monitoring through the uh, soil moisture sensors. Um, there's two main types of controllers right now that are, are being uh, sold as, as smart controllers. Um, and they're both kind of climate based uh, controllers use the ET data and continually adjust the run times. Um, smart controllers, they, they're sensing all that's going on, whether it rained, whether it was sunny, whether it was hot and your irrigation, if you put in a schedule can be modified. Um, the modification of an irrigation schedule um, is is an increase or a decrease as it feels that, that as those inputs say that the plants need more or less water. Here's uh here's what happens here in our valley in the in the Phoenix Scottsdale area historic data the average um, several years worth of ET. Um, your, your zip code might be a little bit different. We put in this particular zip code, which is uh, kind of a, a, a point between Phoenix and Scottsdale. And these are daily rates. 
And if you see the blue bars on this on this uh, scale right here, you can see that they're making a little bit of a bell curve. As it gets warmer, um, you know that evaporation evapotranspiration is increasing, and it increases up to a point, and then it decreases throughout the the rest of the year. We kind of had a funny year this year. Our summer was not our normal summer. We didn't have any rain events, which would also decrease your need for irrigation. And our July and even our August seemed to get warmer and hotter and our increase, uh, it might flatten out this year if, if, if you were looking at the actual curve of this year, it might be a big flat spot for June, July and August. And partial of, partially into September. But um, on a rolling average, if you put multiple years together, it kind of averages out to the point where it's a very similar thing each month of the year. Um, I think we had a year, a few years ago, where July was a little higher than what it normally is. So July might get a little uptick when you average in, you know, five or six years of, of, uh, of evapotranspiration records. But um, you can see that there's obviously a need to increase and a need to decrease. Now, if you're only changing your irrigation controller, your, your, your manual irrigation controller, um, you know, three or four times a year, you know, when it gets hot, you, you crank it up. And then when you realize it's all cranked up and it's not hot anymore, you crank it back down. And maybe in the wintertime or at one or two times a year when it rains, you shut it off. And, and you know, that's not the kind of adjustment that this smart controllers can do. They can gradually increase it and gradually and decrease it as needed, but they need some information to help them do that. And so that's where this, this system of, you know, you put in your zip code, um, some information comes through, uh, you know, through the air to your controller. It knows what's going on. It knows if it's raining. It, um, it knows if it rained in your zip code. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that it doesn't always rain everywhere in a zip code, but generally if the weather is uh, rainy close to you, then the, the evapotranspiration probably went down. And so it can make some pretty wise adjustments. Um, uh, like I said, the paid subscription services are not very popular. Um, maybe for, uh, maybe for um, a golf course or for a, uh, a parks district or something like that. If they're not, uh, you know, up to date, they might be paying a service to give them the information. It's all most of the time it's on the internet and, and it's on the it's published information. Um, real time data would mean that you have your own weather station and you're getting information for your site specifically, and it would probably be the most um, the most ac accurate. A lot of golf courses do have their own weather station and are monitoring their own weather at their golf course and their irrigation systems adjust according to that real time data that they're getting through their weather stations. You know, the 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 inputs on the weather station, you know, it's 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 monitoring the weather to the point where it's looking at temperature and the solar radiation, wind, humidity and rain and making um, the necessary adjustments to the controller, whether it's uh, whether it's a fixed program that needs adjusted or whether it's, um, you know, it's built its own program in its own schedule. Um, and some of the controllers do that. They build their own program in their own schedule as long as you gave that the controller the information that it needed. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing is a lot of people have a smart controller and are running it on as if it were a regular controller they are they aren't letting the the controller do what it can really do um, so um, then it becomes a very expensive toy <laughs> not very expensive and most of them are becoming uh, much more reasonable um, in price right now and so so it's not um, an expensive uh, venture to move to a smart controller but you got to make sure that you're the right person to do it um, this is a the next portion of this is about a scheduling engine and if you um, modify your controller when it's when you install it with all the little bits of information that are necessary and there's lots of details that can be put into it it becomes smarter it knows what it's watering and it knows how it should water it 
that coupled with, you know, like your zip code information and uh, maybe a, a sensor or two for temperature or for, for, you know, something that might moisture uh, in the soil monitoring, you know, can very actively make adjustments to your controller. I mean, hourly, daily, every 15 minutes and, and actually save you quite a bit of water, just constant adjustments that are, are the adjustments that you would make maybe three or four times a year, or maybe that your landscaper would make once every couple of months or, um, you know, so it can, it can monitor it and adjust it. But the, the scheduling engine needs to have a whole bunch of, of data, um, things like soil type, uh, sprinkler type, plant type. What am I watering? The, the controller, it, it, to, in order for it to schedule how it's going to run, it needs to have a, um, a whole bunch of detailed information so that it realizes what it's watering and it will do the, the most effective job for you. Things like, is it in the sun or the shade? Is it full sun? Um, what kind of slope is involved? Those would be details that would need to be put into the controller. Um, the depth of the root zone, what kind of plant material are we watering? Um, and that brings me to questions about, you know, we, a lot of our irrigation systems are old and, you know, all the plants on, are on a valve, whether they're, they're trees or they're cactus or um, the pots are on the same system. So those are going to be hard systems to modify. Um, because what do you tell the smart controller? It's watering everything under the sun. Um, it's not going to be able to do that. It's going it, to, it wants to know some specific details. I think the best place for a smart controller, um, and especially with a, a scheduling engine, would be on a brand new installation where you've gone to the trouble to install your irrigation, where you have all your ground covers on a valve, you have all your cactus on a valve, you have your trees on a separate valve and your shrubs on a separate valves. So, so they're very specific watering needs at that point. And if you told it what it was watering, it would do a very effective job. Um, um, there's more details that can be put into the scheduling engine. You need to know um, the rate of application, uh, the type of application. Um, is it drip irrigation? Is it sprinkler irrigation? Are they bubblers? Uh, and most of the controllers have, uh, you know, just options that you you pick them. And when you pick these, you know, currently in your controller, you have an A program. Generally, we put all of our graphs on the A program. The smart controller will make a separate program up for every valve that it has all this detailed information on, and it will it will figure out how long it needs to water, and it'll figure out how often it needs to water on its own. Um, but does that guarantee you that it's going to do a good job? Not necessarily. Um, so these are some of the details of what, it, what a scheduling engine would need. And it's a lot of questions that need answered. Um, but if you answer all those questions, it's that's what's making it smart. It's learning what, I'm, what am I watering and it can do the best job. Things like your zip code, the plant type, the soil type, the soil slope, application type, these are, the, these are the details that it's looking for information on so that it can schedule an amount of time and a frequency. So the right person for a smart controller is gonna to need to know a little bit or at least be willing to spend the time to figure out what does he need to know to answer all these questions. Um, I was just at a house today where the person had a smart controller and he was running it as a fixed controller because that's what the landscaper wanted to do. So he had um, um, an hour and 15 minutes on plant programs, had mixed plant programs with trees and shrubs and uh, cactus and succulents. So it was a very nice landscape and the landscaper had him watering it every two days for an hour and 15 minutes. And um, you know, the plant material was growing great and looking good and uh, the percentage of the water was 90% of the water bill was going to his irrigation when I figured it out. Um, and the customer was very into it. He's had, a, he's had a smart controller at a previous house and at this house. So he was very into it and he, 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 
He knew all the details. He knew he'd answered all the questions. He needed a little help on a few of them. Um, I helped him with some of those details and he hopes to be able to turn it back to uh, to where it's functioning on its own and making adjustments and not functioning um, on a fixed schedule the way uh, a, a normal irrigation controller does. Can the smart controller save water? Yes. Yes, they can. Um, especially if the person who normally adjusts the irrigation controller doesn't do it very often. The fact that they change the controller settings so often and they're monitoring the actual need for water is is very effective way of saving water. Um, how much will they save? <laughs> that's a that's a question that that's very hard to answer. Um, they will save it if you add all those details. So a properly programmed smart controller can save water. Um, you know, a lot of people. Um, we found this out, we did a, a, a study a few years ago, and we found out that a lot of people are very thrifty, let's just say, and aren't watering enough. Um, in that situation, a smart controller might actually increase your water use. So, so be prepared for that. And, and um, the beauty of the smart controller is that if it, is more water if it's using more water than you desire to use there are ways to modify that to make it use less if you're if you're um, managing your landscape at a at a stress level that is you know a lot of people don't want to see but a lot of people want to manage it right at that stress level um, there are modifications that you can make on these settings and each one of those um, each one of those modifications has an effect and most of them you can make those uh, adjustments to affect the either the amount of water being applied or the frequency that it is applied at so so you can modify it to do what, what you want you just have to be the person who's willing to get involved in that and do it to it because a lot of times your landscaper isn't going to do those details um, most of the time these things when you set them up they need to be adjusted more and more to get them dialed in kind of uh, if you uh, if you're okay with the increased water you're probably going to have some healthier plants um, but you may have a little bit higher water bill so they can save water if you're watering too much now if you're not watering enough you're probably going to um, <laughs> spend a little extra water on your plants So you got to spend the time, you got to get it uh, properly configured, or you've got to have somebody help you uh, properly configure it. And that's one of the things that we do. We have appointments where we go to people's house. If you've got a new smart controller and you don't know exactly how to set all those details and you want some help, we have a program in the city of Scottsdale. It's the outdoor water efficiency checks that we can spend a little time with you and help you with the details. Um, you have to monitor it regularly. Um, it's not the it's not the set it and forget it kind of thing that you you, you would see on a TV commercial where oh, this takes care of everything that you need. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You still have to pay attention. Um, what I found is when you do have a smart controller, the landscaper feels like he doesn't have to deal with the irrigation too much anymore because it's taking care of itself. And that leads to little leaks and little leaks lead to bigger leaks. And if nobody's paying attention to leaks because everybody thinks the smart controller's got it all under control, um, you, then we, we're doing that wasting water in the most efficient way possible thing again. Um, so you still have to check for leaks. And that's one of the things that we can teach you at that outdoor water efficiency check. So. If you're in Scottsdale and you just bought a smart controller and you want some assistance, please feel free to get an appointment. You get it simply by calling the water department and setting, it, setting up an appointment. You know, a lot of times uh, um, when a smart controller is added, there's, uh, there's going to be a period of time where people are unsure of what's going on and it's either overwatering or underwatering. 
Um, and it, it means that you do have to spend some more time with it and dial it in. Some of the very first controllers that came out, um, you know, the instructions were you would go out there and you would add 5% or take away 5% and then spend a week and verify whether the plant material looks happier or doesn't look happy. Um, you know, those are details that are, are um, kind of out of your control. You just go ahead and add some time to it or take some time away from it. But it's actually all those other details that, that are the important details that would make that um, as efficient as possible. Those things like the sprinkler type and the slope and the soil type. And if you can get all those information in, then the controller knows what it's doing. It, it can pretty much handle that. Um, the amount of fine tuning or dialing in that you're going to have to do would be smaller. Um, a little increase or a little decrease it may be need, needed. All those little details have that have an effect. So um, if you if you change one of those details, it's going to have an effect on how much water you're using or or it may increase it, may decrease it, depends on which way you change it. The best thing to do is to make sure that your irrigation system is uh, tuned up and in, is in good working condition before you add a smart controller. Um, a lot of times if your smart controller goes to a longer, uh, a, a deep infrequent irrigation cycle because it knows that that's what's best from the details that you were able to put in there and you used to run, you know, a shallow frequent um, irrigation cycle, but, but you have a big leak on that system somewhere, it's going to leak for a longer time when it runs a deep infrequent watering cycle. So. Let's make sure that our irrigation systems and our components are in as good a possible condition uh, when we start with a smart controller. Um, selecting a smart controller, do your homework. Um, there's a lot of different smart controllers right now. There's probably probably 10 or 15 of them. Um, you, you would ideally want it to be able to adjust the irrigation frequency, not just um, work on the same frequency and increase time or decrease time. Um, uh, should be able to be configured with a water window um, from time to time. Um, you know, the the sun is hot and, and dry here. If we if we were to apply water at the wrong time of day, um, chances are we could lose as much as 25% of, of water from a sprinkler system that's spraying on grass lawn. If it's a hot, dry or hot, windy day, we could just watch that water evaporate into the cl clouds. So a water window would allow you to uh, set a time that that zone needs to operate so that it's effectively uh, getting the water that you're applying into the um, area where you're applying it. So selecting a smart controller, um, you're, you're looking for certain features. If you read about the controllers and some of them are, um, a lot, uh, how do we say, user more user friendly than others, um, but it's not unlike any iteration of irrigation controllers throughout time. When they first started making regular controllers, they were a little too digital and a little too computery, and people didn't like that. And they figured out over time that they had to adjust that to make it more usable, user friendly. And they're doing the same thing with smart controllers. Smart controllers are getting um, more and more user friendly all the time. When they were when they first came out, people were scared of them. I mean, even the the contractors were like, "Oh, I don't know what to do with that." Sorry, you know. So, but it's getting much better today. Um, most of this information comes through um, SWAT, which is a water. Um, Association Smart Water Applications Technology, where they rate this equipment and they they give it a, a rating that says that this is applicable for things like our rebate program. We have a, a rebate program that that in Scottsdale, if you buy a smart controller in Scottsdale, that we are going to uh, uh, if you fill out the application and send us a copy of your receipt, we're going to take the dollar amount off of your water bill. So. Um, it's basically like getting a, a free controller. If you feel like you're the person for a smart controller and have capabilities to to take care of one and run it correctly, um, it's almost a no brainer when it's basically free. <laughs> uh, 
they are the way of the future. Smart controllers are what we're going to turn to. Um, you know, water's not going to get cheaper. Uh, I know that through this summer, these summer months when it was really, really hot and dry and no rain, um, I had lots of appointments where, where people had their irrigation controllers running a lot and running every day. And it was, um, in some situations, if you're only running a little bit, you have to run every day because your plants were probably drying up and dying. But, you know, doing it correctly, um, I tell people this all the time, running shallow frequent irrigation cycles is going to use a lot more water than if you run deep and infrequent irrigation cycles. And that's what a smart controller should be able to do for you. All right. With that, we will take any questions if you have them. There's some information up there. We are uh, the Water Conservation Department. And there's our website. There's our uh, there's our uh, email and our phone number. And that phone number is the number that you would call if you decided that you wanted to have an appointment to help set up your controller. Yes, so while we're waiting on questions, Bill, I have a few things I'd like to ask you. So you mentioned plant stress. And I think for everyone listening right now, you alluded to it, but what does that mean and how much stress is good? Um, you know, uh, plant stress is not good. Um, ideally, our plants would not be stressed. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you water a plant, it grows. So if it grows, it needs maintained. So people panic and they try to water less to slow their plant growth down and they end up, you know, with a new, a new cost. Well, that tree died because I didn't water it enough. And now I've got to remove that tree. So ideally, any symptoms of stress you would try to alleviate, whether it's changing the drip emitters around that plant to get that one plant more water or, you know, adjusting the irrigation system to put out more water in time or frequency. Um, ideally, you would do the first thing, you would deal with a single plant and deal with those situations as they occur, uh, not water the whole thing more because if the other plants were showing signs of stress, that would be um, inappropriate to do. All right, we do have an additional question. Uh, and the question is, what is the best way to monitor for leaks? So if you, uh, if you're a homeowner, and you have your uh, irrigation system, from time to time, you should go out to the water meter and clean it all up and find out how many gallons a minute the different zones at your house use when they're in use. Um, the zone flow, the gallons per minute that the zone uses is like the fingerprint of the zone. It is the reflection of the outlets that are in use, whether they're sprinkler heads or whether they're drip irrigation, and it presents a number. Um, typically, if we have a drip irrigation system and it's a front yard only or a backyard only, it's usually around two or three gallons a minute. Um, if it's a whole house system, it can be as much as four or five gallons a minute, um, depending on the system. Now, if it's a sprinkler system for a turf area, it can be anything from uh, six gallons a minute on heads that apply water very slowly to, you know, 15, 20 gallons a minute on heads that are applying water really fast. Um, so knowing those details and knowing how many gallons a minute a zone uses allows you to uh, use that information the next time you check it to make sure they're running in the same way. That number shouldn't change. The amount of water that we use changes when we increase the number of irrigations or increase the time and it decreases, but the flow stays the same. It's the fingerprint of the zone. All right, and just for additional information, Bill did allude to rebates, and that I have included some information on the announcement section on your Q&A area. Uh, we have a, a online application that we encourage you to fill out, uh, but that website that is listed, scottsdaleaz.gov slash water slash rebates, also has the most recent program rules and deadlines. 
So if you are feeling inspired, this is kind of a good way to help you fund your project. And also, as Bill alluded to and mentioned directly, uh, the phone number for scheduling your outdoor water efficiency check, which includes information on your smart controller if you have one, is available to schedule via the number on the screen. All right, it looks like we have an additional question. Okay, from Steve, is it better to seek controllers and irrigation system parts through the big box stores or from other landscaping businesses? Uh, my typical answer to that is that um, a lot of the irrigation supply houses are going to have a lot more parts and pieces and, and things for you if you're doing irrigation work and irrigation repair. Um, they're less in tune with the homeowner than with somebody who does it as a business, but they will sell you the product. You're going to buy it at a higher price than a contractor might. Um, the box stores are okay, but ch chances are they're not going to have the expertise and they're not going to have the, the variety of parts and pieces to make sure that you get the exact right thing. But, you know, for a lot of things, you can buy them at the big box stores. All right, does anybody have any additional questions? while you have expert Bill here. And in case you're curious about the rebate program, uh, Bill did highlight some features that are important for you to select or consider when you're selecting an irrigation controller, smart irrigation controller specifically. For our rebate program, we do require that whatever you select be water sense labeled. So available on our website, there is also a link to search the particular controller you're considering via EPA's website. And so that's kind of a good way to, to get started as well. If maybe all of this sounds great, but you don't know which one you wanna consider, that's another resource for you to look into. But it looks like you were so thorough that we don't have any additional questions. Uh, for anybody who is watching or joining us after the fact, if you think of anything, please feel free to email us at waterconservation at scottsdaleaz.gov. That is also on your screen. And we appreciate you joining us for this program.